thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction uh, Robin um, so welcome into this uh, uh, webinar um, regarding uh, the um, solving challenges in defect inspection for uh, advanced uh, uh, optics so um, as uh, you know um, Bruker is a, a wide and well-recognized uh, instrumentation uh, manufacturer. Uh, we are part of the nanosurfaces divisions uh, that support, let's say, the optical applications in a wide range. So we have uh, ability uh, to uh, measure the hardness and do nano annotations on the coatings, for instance. We can also test uh, whether uh, some coatings are hard and resistant enough uh, versus wear through a tribology and mechanical tester system. We can also uh, provide uh, and measure the thickness of those coatings as well as the residual stress uh, whenever we use the stylus uh, profilers. And of course, we can use atomic force microscopy if we like to go uh, for inside a view at the nanometer scale uh, for topography measurements. But today, uh, our focus is on uh, non-contact uh, optical profiles. Um, as uh, some of you may know, um, we have two main principles. Uh, we have focus variations from Bruker Alicorna as well as uh, interferometric uh, optical profilers, which will be uh, the uh, technique of use uh, during this uh, webinar. So the focus of today is really about uh, controlling higher hand uh, optics. Um, I would define what it is about, but it's really uh, optics having high cost and having the need for zero defects. And what we will offer in this webinars is a solution around direct measurements of topography with a non-contact profiler's uh, system. So from that surface measurements, uh, what you will learn is ability to detect defect even on a complex uh, shape, as well as be able to uh, properly rank all defects thanks to this topography characterizations. Um, all the way together, uh, we will finalize uh, the defect review into a meaningful map that will help uh, um, engineering and process engineer to define whether the optics should be uh, rejected, uh, put back into the process and into which process or on contrary be stamped as good. And finally, we will finish with uh, the possibility to measure large and aspheric optics, which is quite uh, unique. So a bit of background. So I was mentioning um, high-end or advanced or fine optics. Basically, you have uh, some kind of example uh, over there with like inertial detection system or gyro laser system. Uh, optics for high power uh, laser beam or uh, deep UV lithography. So all those optics um, have in common the fact that defect is really not uh, a possibility. So the reason is for instance like if we take a high power optics usually we have a block of Android optics that are concatenated uh, along if the last one on the beam has a defect, then this defect will reflect back the power of the laser to the lens behind and create again a defect. And by a domino effect, uh, if the last lens has a defect, the whole optical beam and optical path will be affected and destroyed. So you really understand that here for this kind of optics, there is a need of added person inspections and a zero defect uh, policy. So this is what we are after today on that webinar. Regarding specification for such a high quality optics, um, of course they are the standard scratch and dig you, um, in the, um, specification you will find for regular optics. But on top of that, you will have numerous uh, numbers of specifications. 
Notably, roughness is usually a critical and below nanometer, um, typically between um, 4 to 10 angstroms. And also you will find out that uh, gradients, uh, so basically local slope, will not exceed a, a certain micro radians or milli in, in the worst case. So those things as well, specify peak to valleys below a certain level too. But in general, it's everything is summarized into one single plot we're called poor spectrum density, which is basically roughness for a given special wavelengths. And what you can see is a real uh, measurement in red, uh, and you see several curves because we need to cover actually large range from 10 millimeter range up to 10 microns and all this curve needs to be below a specified line and exceeding to a certain level will reject uh, the, the lens. So the summary of this high quality optics, zero defect plus some nanometer roughness and definitively a lateral resolution that should be in a range of microns if we can uh, sustain uh, the special uh, frequency to, to measure. So now we, we will speak about non-contact interferometric provider because this will be the system of choice. So basically the system consists on uh, light injections through an interferometric objective. This objective splits the path into two parts. A first one is reflected inside a reference mirror inside this objective, while the second part uh, of the path is focused on the surface. The two paths recombine into digital cameras that allow us to see what's going on. So in case of broad white illuminations uh, over uh, a bead, we see a concentric uh, fringes or moiré pattern that is very much reduced in height uh, because of the low coherence of, of the source. So in that case, the distance, the high distance from here to here does not exceed more than one microns. On contrary, if we use monochromatic illuminations, then we spread out the fringes everywhere and get more in more interferometric modes. And actually, this two illumination correspond to two core different modes used to reveal topography with this non-contact interferometry profilers. There is one element uh, which consists of uh, scanning uh, the wall um, um, uh, objectives toward the surface in, in order to make sure that the fringes uh, scan through the surface and then uh, by spotting out uh, the focal plane with the prism of fringes, the system rebuilt the wall 3D shape of the step like here. Whenever we use monochromatic illuminations, we are actually using the same principle as large aperture interferometer. So we are using phase shifting where we have a short piezo scanning that will actually uh, shift uh, the uh, objective by lambda over 8 in order to shift fringes by lambda over 4 and from this shift and intensity measurement at specific time we rebuild the phase map which uh, translate directly into the height of uh, every pixel through the wavelengths. So those are the two ways to rebuild topography from anthropometric profiles. And basically, um, anthropometry profilers are very suitable and uniquely suitable for uh, controlling high-hand optics for uh, following reasons. The first one is that the vertical resolution is independent from the objective. This attribute is very unique compared to any other non-contact slash optical profilers base. Um, the reason is the vertical resolution arises from the source and not from uh, the objective. In that case, we obtain a vertical resolutions around 3 nanometer for the vertical scanning system and uh, below or around 10 picometer for phase shifting. So this is 
quite important for the reason that for um, hunting defect we want to capture the largest uh, widest area possible while still retaining capability to measure nanometer vertical distances of peaks or um, scratches or um, groove which we can be done with interferometry profilers. The second attribute is actually we have a true capable system to measure nanometer and below. This is based on interferometer and interferometric uh, principle. It, 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 uh, there's no need to demonstrate that it, it is by essence there and we can truly measure uh, angstrom level uh, vertical changes. There's another element which is usually not mentioned. Um, interferometric profilers is based on the coherence phenomena with presence of fringes. And in that case, a uh, fringe is a relative change of intensity. So we don't care about whether the surface is very uh, highly reflective or low reflectivity. Uh, there's still a certain contrast of black and white from fringes. So this makes this uh, method very robust, measuring shiny made surfaces, but also smooth and rough surfaces. So we can all the way along measure white kind of paper, for instance, all the way down to super um, polished, highly reflective mirrors, for instance. But more importantly is, if the system doesn't see any fringes, there will be no data. Uh, contrary to other optical technique where you may have a spurious artifactual um, response, uh, you exactly know as an operator or engineer that the system was enabled to measure because there will be no data. So at least you can further drill down and understand where it comes from and maybe get uh, uh, the conclusion that there was a very big defect uh, in there. Last but not the least, on all that technique of interferometric profilers, the vertical height is determined independently for each individual pixel. So there is no real limitation in terms of lateral resolutions except the one given by the objective and how oversampling or undersampling you uh, get on the digital camera. So getting some micron resolution is definitely uh, achievable. And just to illustrate this by uh, images, you see here uh, a Linux configurations having a, a 34 millimeter working distance, being able to measure 28 mean 28 nanometer mean roughness on the bottom of that white peak cup. Um, quite unique there in terms of vertical resolution versus uh, working distance. Um, as much as ability to measure sub nanometer mean roughness on a very different conditions like according uh, on the mirrors with high reflectivity all the way down to an anti-reflective coatings even so we are measuring on a high uh, magnification so like using 20x or 50x magnification to get sub nanometer mean roughness. To illustrate uh, the lateral resolutions and get a bit of um, boundary conditions. So here this is really the ultimate lateral resolution we can achieve with that system. Um, it, con it is actually a sub wavelength optical guy um, built with hexagonal pattern of silicon oxide pillars inside a silicon matrix. And what we see here is well-defined individual pillars around uh, 200 nanometer diameters and spaced by less than a micron. So achieving here uh, a one micron through lateral resolution is definitely uh, possible with, with that technique. So we have all the attributes we need to uh, perform the measurement. So now we can move toward the solution and how we use this uh, non-contact interferometry providers to get the full solution for quality control. So the first one 
is about the poor spectrum density. And as uh, we were discussing, uh, there is a need to measure a, a large um, a spectral band and this means that we have to collect uh, different images at different uh, with different objective and this is where we can um, check with a short movie uh, how with the motorized turret multiple objectives we can automatically measure on a silicon carbide surface so we built up different recipes uh, calling different uh, objectives and then the system will automatically toggle between the, the, the objectives in a one single click operator launches the procedure the system perform and find where the focus is then acquires the slope such as on this flat mirrors uh, the fringes are new to ensure the best reproducibility and it repeats until it's very perfectly null before to engage uh, the measurements in a phase shifting interferometry. So it's very fast in a few couple of seconds. We can average out uh, multiple images and then what you see as the system automatically switches to the next objective. So here as you see is compressed fringes uh, then uh, the auto tip tilt will even work in such a very challenging conditions in order to reach back this new fringe positions in order to optimize uh, the performances of the measurements and having the lower noise possible. And again, the system automatically um, switches to the next objective. And during this acquisitions uh, in background, the system acquires and records data into the R drive desk. Um, in that case, uh, the software is flexible to make sure that the data are acquired with the proper name, serial numbers, as well as objective and zoom lenses used for the measurements, which will make then easy to uh, get information uh, later on. So we continue like this until the Android 15X uh, objectives. So what we obtain in a automatic way is a series of five images going from 2.5x objective all the way down to Android 15x objectives. And you see an example of form remove such as you can see that at the low magnification silicon carbide mirror is very smooth and flat but the further we improve um, the lateral resolutions the, the better detail we start and see as a grain of silicon carbide. However, the most interesting is you can load all those informations into a single graph of power spectrum through the software. So in that case, you obtain your final deliverable that will stamp or not uh, the lens and you can draw your lines to tell whether um, the uh, quality control was successful or not. So this is like a standard way to get a full automation and a seamless collection of data without any operator in front of the system and then combine this into a report um, to send out with the, the lens. Now we will move to the uh, sessions of automatic inspections. Um, by automatic inspections, I mean uh, Android person control for Android person of the parts of the lenses of the windows, as much as Android person aerial inspections uh, of interest. So, in that case, for most of the optics, there is no point to have a manual inspections uh, by operator, uh, even under a sodium lamps operator will not spot out by naked eyes anything. The defects are too small, too narrow and not deep enough to be revealed that matter. Usually um, operator uses Nomarski microscope and navigate through playing with uh, the focusing and the level, uh, relative level of um, the sample versus the objective such as there is some kind of black and white contrast appearing and revealing 
um, scratch or dig or, or some kind of a protrusion. The point is there are a lot of inconsistency because it's based on intensity level and operator adjustment. Plus, whenever you start to reveal the presence of the defect, there is still a critical question of is that a groove? Is that a protrusions? Is that the contaminations? You never know because this is purely 2D microscopy, so there is no vertical metrology. Um, you cannot even spot out whether um, there is a large groove or deep groove or height difference. Um, you don't know, and for that reason, there is no process where you could say, let's go for next raw polishing step to remove this um, protrusion or maybe this is a, a third uh, party contamination coming from slurry. In that case, you don't know. So what we want and offer here is a fully automated and attended uh, uh, operations where the system collect the full 3D data sets and then make analysis to spot out the defect. To do that and because when you start and screen down uh, multiple lenses at the different level of process, you, you never know what to expect. Um, and of course, a smooth optics with defects start to be a rough surface. So what we have tailored around is a self-adapting mode that will seamlessly, automatically, in a clever way, toggle between a pure vertical scanning mode or versus a phase shifting. So this mode can operate either on the rough uh, sample like coins or can act as well on a, a very steady, a steep slope of from MEMS, uh, sharp edges for instance, or randomly um, medium roughness from a machine surface or other way down to um, uh, micro lenses which has a steady smooth slope. So in that case whatever the configuration, whatever the defect is, uh, you will get the data. Uh, more importantly as well, we this mode operates very well on the high reflectivity contrast. So this is an example of solar panel where you have uh, texture silicon surface which reflects a few 0.1% of light and a silver line that reflects 90 percent so you can still measure and this is some kind of case you may have whenever you have a chip on uh, your um, anti-reflective coating suddenly you have uh, a difference between low reflectivity and high reflectivity because of the bare substrate the same apply whenever you have uh, very uh, mirror-like coatings to reflect more light if there is chip, then then the bare substrate will reflect much less. Um, so in, in in that case, you you can go and and screen any kind of situations. And once you have this, then you will start to g develop a very robust step by step automation. So you will need autofocusing to automatically find where the focus is, and it needs to be robust, such as you can spot out different location in case the defect is just in the center for instance and make sure that you will be able to measure. Um, as you have seen during the movie um, the auto tip tilt is also very robust it can scope with steady slope and, and do uh, iterative uh, work such as the fringes are null for instance. Um, this will be also important in case of concave convex shape to afford and compensate as much as possible for the angles. There is also an element where we may want to use auto intensity. Um, this has to do with uh, QAQC on uh, lenses before and after the coating. So in case the coating is made to, make, to reflect more, um, the bare optics has a low reflectivity, so it would need a higher amount of light why whatever it goes after the coating, this uh, intensity will need to be much lower. In that case, we can use a single recipe to map out defect on any kind of lenses 
without the user having the need to input or choose and have the possibility to make the wrong choice. And once you have set up the, all the parameters to uh, ensure the measurement uh, will be made on a proper uh, manner, analysis will uh, play a critical role to on the fly detect in a reliable way uh, the defect. And we'll explain on the next slide how to do. Um, but of course, um, inspecting ended person of active era of an uh, advanced optical component means you will certainly end up with thousands of location to be tested. In that case, you don't want 1000 data set. You just want the data sets where you have defects. And fortunately, you may have just few of them which will be easy then to look through and really get a further um, um, advanced eye looking on how the data effect looks like, having higher clue when it could have happened, and whether you can record this defect by a certain specific uh, uh, iteration of process. And finally, you may want to, after the full automation, display those data in a meaningful way. Um, that's the reason why there is an output of the data uh, over there uh, after uh, automation. And third party can be uh, anything like advanced third party software or simple um, Excel macros, as we will see later on. So, once the conditions are reached for the best measurements, uh, you end up with this type of uh, data sets. So um, you see a fairly smooth blue-like surface and then you have uh, in red uh, some protrusion or peaks and dark blue it's a groove or pits. Um, in such a configurations for a flat window for instance it's pretty easy to use high thresholding to spot out every single island that goes above or below a certain level. And in that case, every single uh, location um, um, that has higher level of threshold, you can work out independently the average um, diameter, which derive from the equivalent error if this defect would be fully round then highest part of the defect as well as the extension along x and y axis such as you know for instance a bit of dissymmetry is that just a round shape in that case average diameter will be close to the x and y diameter or is that more scratch like where the average diameter is fully different from the x and y um, so you have extra information and the same happens for pits and you get all the information over there. What is important to note is you may have thousands of those locations and for each of those locations the system will be able to save into a single comma separato, uh, separated variable phi all those details. So you could have at the hand a complete list of defects and having an idea on how important they are. If we are going to more complex surface where you have you start to have a bit of shape, it can be a freeform optics, it can be parabolic optics, uh, it can be a, as well a certain uh, Fresnel like. Uh, it start to be very complex to um, leverage out and make it make the background flat. Um, and you will see later on that it's also uh, very time non-effective. So in that case, it's be better to go to derivative image, which consists of extracting the slope along x and y. So basically, it's a gradient image. And then we can, again, do a multiple detections of any uh, islands that exceed a certain slow fluctuation. So in that case, we can work, again, average diameter um, extension in X and Y to get a good idea. So here we see it's very, very circular. Uh, but what is important as well is um, 
we can get an average value of or maximum slope, which is exactly the specifications uh, for high-end optics uh, using synchrotrons or X-ray, uh, for instance, they, there will be not a specification in a mean roughness in nanometer, but more maximum slope on in a micro region, for instance. So in that case, derivative image gives to you the right output. It is also very interesting for on the fly to measure uh, and use derivative. The reason is it is way faster. So if we use complex shape and start to use Gaussian second order filter to get rid of the uh, shape and spot out defects, uh, we'll see that it takes much longer because it's very computer intensive. So if you think carefully of having thousand locations where you need a uh, few extra seconds of post-processing, at the hand you will have 5, 10 minutes, 30 minutes more. Gradient analysis is way faster and on the fly can spot out exactly location where you have some issues. You can also later on um, in our system, you can save the data and have a second instance of software on a different computer doing patch processing uh, in a way that you free up real-time measurements. If you want to go a step further, and in that case, r rank really the defects. Um, in that case, we will go to the more advanced software, and you have an example here of what the software can do on such an image where you see a lot of different pits. Uh, you have all the way from scratches, round pits, or larger areas. In that case, the system will help you to get out more parameters. It is very important, like for optics such as deep UV lithography or small angle optical beam, to um, understand whether it's a scratch or not, because a round pit will not act in the same way as a scratch. And a given scratch will not act in the same way whether it has uh, it is parallel versus the optical beam or orthogonal. Likewise, even the polarization of, of the optical beam uh, may have a different behavior versus orientation of a scratch. So it's, it's very important to rank the scratches in the uh, right way. So what we can use is a form factor. So one is really fully spherical shape like this one. So it's like 0.7 here. Uh, if we go to scratch, uh, it's just 0.15, so close to zero. But then we have also roundness that will help us to further emphasize how round the shape is, um, having uh, almost zero for this scratch and having uh, a roughness which is slightly bigger inter and bigger form factor uh, along that bigger scratch. Likewise, we can operate the orientation. The scratch here is almost uh, horizontal with eight degrees, and this one is almost vertical at 90 degrees. So essentially here, the analysis toolkit is complete and allow you to calculate and analyze the defect. In that case, it's usually a post-processing uh, which can occur afterward whenever you have just tens of images to, analyzes, to analyze. But more importantly is on the fly, you can just measure the surface and you can split the type of defect. So you can have from that image, you can have an image of only pits or only scratches. And for instance, you can just um, exclude this regular pits that will not trigger any impact on your product and only focus on scratches. So in that case, this software will allow you to really select the right defect uh, you are after. And once you have defined the wall analysis, then we can on the fly store uh, a summary information into a database, which is again into a 
comma separated variable file so easily um, open by Excel but most importantly is live the system will update let's say the numbers of defect in peaks the numbers of defect in um, uh, grooves it will tell you uh, if you have split your active error into a matrix uh, which row which column this has occurred as well as the maximum height or extensions which is important because some of the high-end optics specification will actually allow or not specific numbers of defect for certain size and exclude some uh, other so it's important to know but what is interesting is live operator can look at numbers of defects that happen per locations or per row for instance and decide whether there are too many and stop automation or um, there is also an averaging and max or min ranking here for the size of defects so if the optics uh, does not uh, op optics um, specifications uh, does not allow defect larger than 100 micron then you see already a maximum being 185 you understand that you have to stop and uh, put this lens on hold and for and bring back some further processing uh, or directly throw it and and get it on a on, on a trash so it saves time to to see that live but whenever it goes all the way across and get the summary it's easy to build up uh, customized um, executable Excel macros such as you can have a complete display of uh, locations and importance of defect so here this is an example of um, a lens uh, where we have a square aperture and on that lens uh, the defect uh, are plot in terms of peaks so this was pre your cleaning and you see in red the, a lot of defects uh, and in green uh, region where there is no defect actually because it's peak we can suspect that those are, might be uh, third-party bodies like remaining particle from the slurry used for polishing like diamond paste uh, it could be organic contaminations or it, it can be uh, non adherent uh, particles so in that case a cleaning process will certainly help to get the lens um, or the optics into spec and into spec this is what exactly what you see after the cleaning you see a perfectly nice and almost zero defect especially on the center only on a lower left side there are remaining peaks that are certainly due to uh, real matter peaks and this one will certainly require extra polishing step but the most important is because the data are saved you can always come back to the initial data set have a look and determine whether it works to repolish or say no nope, good enough for the center um, let's uh, let's save cost and money on on, on that one um, also with Excel it's easy to have a summary tab like a, a sum up all the numbers of defect get spot out the highest height of the defect and the longest extension such as you can compare in uh, further uh, uh, compare versus uh, the wish specs if we go a step ahead um, we plot uh, peaks but actually uh, we can into Excel create a formula uh, which uh, bring the severity factor um, so severity is a mix of numbers of defects maximum length of defect as well um, the maximum height or depth and this one will be important because then an operator will understand uh, whether uh, the lens is or optics is good or not so this is basically um, the positions and every um, severity of defect is summarized by the size of that bubble and in that case we have peaks in blue and in orange we have pits 
Again, what we clearly see on that uh, window is we have a critical severe pit defect here, which is almost in the middle of that optics. So definitely, absolutely not good. So in that case, it's uh, questionable whether this optics uh, should go all the way uh, from the start because it peaks, so it may require a bit of polishing, cleaning, or whether it's only a cleaning and a quick polishing. So again, looking at this data will help. If it would have been here, uh, a valet's, uh, for instance, or because it's a pit, uh, the main issue is there is no protrusions to erode. So in that case, uh, it will be critical for the lens to be thrown away or to be fully reshaped over there. If it would have been blue, certainly here we could have just reduced some polishing and saved some, some time and, and money over there. So what you see is just from initial CSV phi generated, automatically generated by the system, you can then end up with a meaningful plot that gives to you a guide uh, for the decision on what to do. And finally, uh, we have this case of large or aspheric uh, uh, optics. Uh, here, usually we deal with optics for um, uh, large-scale synchrotrons. Uh, we have like such as ESRF, uh, Diamond Light in in UK, um, and for this one, the main challenge is first of all to carry the sample under the system, because you have a large form factor, which means also uh, EV uh, weight. So we have designed for our customer uh, a large gantry system that can accept uh, wide or long optics or EV optics that sh up to one tons. And this system is based again on non-contact interferometric uh, principle. In that case, we can ask ourselves whether the performances are right with such a large um, bridge and ask ourselves what's about stability and what you see here is a real data set collected on such a large bridge system over fine optics this those are astonishing data where you see a long repeatability test over one hour with the one x objective so one x objective is quite bulky objective very prone to pick up any mechanical vibrations so what we see here is having a six a picometer one sigma repeatability on over one hour. So this shows that how stable this platform is and how suitable uh, it is to characterize uh, roughness, uh, poor spectrum density, as well as spot out defect into a sub nanometer uh, level. The interesting point from that platform is you have a nice swivel head of plus minus 45 degree angle and associated with the Linux um, objective which has a 34 millimeter working distance it's really easy to end up in almost orthogonal way thus edges and ensure you can measure uh, roughness even beyond the numerical aperture of the objective because you're just in orthogonal and compensate for the slope. So in that case, for such a parabolic optics uh, or freeform optics, like from the TNO DELF, we have ability to measure defect roughness. Even so it starts to be more manual, there is a way to assess the quality of those optics in a very unprecedented and unique uh, ways. So as a conclusion, um, this webinar has shown how non-contact interferometric profilers was able to uh, spot out defect through a full topography measurements. And through the topography measurements, it was uh, possible to fully characterize each defect, further rank them, uh, qualify them, before showing them into a meaningful map. 
and those informations uh, carry on uh, the conclusion to what to do with this optics like is that good uh, is that bad and thrown away or on contrary it's not good enough yet we just need to redo and repeat certain iterations of the process or certain step of the process to make it good so thanks for your intentions and now i'm opening up uh, for the uh, q a uh, sessions if you want to reach me directly feel free to drop out uh, email question as well to samuel dot let's go at brooker dot com thank you very much Samuel and attendees if you have questions now is the time to enter them in the question box to the right of your screen and uh, we'll go ahead with the first question here Samuel and the question is can these non-contact methods be used to measure surface profile as well. Yes, so in, in term of we can just stitch together single field of view and get a profile or certain given optics uh, presuming we have enough working distance and presuming that the slope are not getting too um, steep because for very high-hand uh, optics the surface is totally uh, mirror-like there is no specular uh, reflection of light uh, and in that case we are limited by the numerical aperture of the uh, given objective but definitely we can uh, stitch all together and, and get a profile uh, one of the examples um, we did was to assess certain flatness of optics um, or to use a certain a long curvature radius from X-ray or synchrotron optics. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Can you can we get a copy of the slides? So I'll just take this opportunity to let everyone know you will receive a link to the slides tomorrow and a follow-up note along with a link to the recording. And the next question here that we have, do you have a plan to develop this into a turnkey solution? So right now uh, we have, let's say, a complete solution coming, let's say, for collecting data set and a building up of summary files. Uh, what we are missing yet is uh, a full connection with third-party display. Uh, which can be done by, by building Excel macros. So let's say 99% of the job is, is done and we are looking forward to uh, collaborate um, and uh, get uh, joint collaborations in order to go up to the full hand of, of that um, optical inspection. Okay, thank you. Next question. You are characterizing scratches and digs. Can you do a pa can you do pass fail decisions against a scratch dig specification of ISO one zero one one zero? So as I was saying, uh, for advanced optics, the the scratch and dig uh, uh, comes to a clear limitation. Uh, usually, for those advanced optics. Uh, the key requirements are uh, numbers of defects um, and how critical those defects are and usually it's it, it's summarized by we want to sit in roughness we want no more than X number of defects and any of those defects should not just exceed more than uh, 100 microns in length and 10 nanometers in height for instance so th those are way more complex specification that goes beyond the, the pure ISO norm behind scratch and, and dig. So in that matter uh, for this IN optics it goes as well into iteration. So you usually take the metrology part of defect review to improve the process and confirm the process as being um, 
fine tune to the right directions. So it, all that makes the, the pass fail criteria very, very arbitrary and very challenging. That's the reason why we, we, we get like map up defects, uh, tab summarizing the defects, such as uh, the uh, engineer responsible for the productions determine whether those uh, optics uh, pass or fail. So th th this is no, there is no black and white uh, decision here. It's a more um, complex uh, decisions, which usually relies on the finally on on the human uh, decision. Okay, thank you. Here's a question from somebody who missed the very beginning of your presentation. What is the visible range for scanning? How long does it take to scan that area on the square defect number page? Was it assumed those were the same part before and after cleaning? The 11 at the bottom of the cleaning page was not there in the first image. So the, the single acquisition in, in phase shifting uh, takes usually um, two seconds. Uh, autofocus, uh, autofocusing and measurement, that, that's usually the range. Um, if we use uh, this mode where we are vertically scanning, it will take certainly uh, four or five seconds easily. Um, and that uh, brings back for depending on, on the lens shape, uh, you will usually end up with a full measurement time between 15 minutes up to one hour. That's, that's the usual point for a single lens. And then you can position multiple lens into the, uh, uh, below the providers. Uh, we have customer uh, using our system uh, for which uh, the wall automations with uh, tens of lenses take almost uh, 20, 20 uh, hours. But they, the reason why they do that is they, they cannot just afford to have a defect and they have to screen down another person. So this is a usual uh, timing, usually per lens or per um, effective era for those small lenses is in between 15 to 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. What are the limitations of this method? Well, in, in that, uh, the main limitation is uh, definitely um, a bit of part of the slow to, because we are measuring real 3D uh, data sets. Um, you may have other technique that could just quickly screen out uh, the data and get some kind of um, a dual laser beam uh, interfering together. Uh, you will or get some kind of scatterometry as well. All those technique gets get something nice because they will quickly um, in, in a minute or so give to you an information on uh, where the defects are located. Uh, however, the, the critical point is you, you, you will not know uh, whether it's, um, it's a peak or protrusion matter of matter or uh, simply a valley. And it's important because it relay back to um, the quality of lenses. In some of optical application, having a valley is, is not an issue. Having a peak of matter, it's critical. Um, and also in term of whenever um, those lenses are at the end of the process, the costs uh, for this lens are very high. So they are pretty expensive. You don't want to throw them. You, you want to revamp, you want to reprocess them such as they are again good. So for that, you have to know whether it's a peak, if, if it's a, a, a dig or a scratch, because otherwise you, you don't know what to do. So. Uh, there is like a balance between how much information you want from the defect and how quickly you want. Um, An other limitation as well is, as I was saying, um, uh, stating before, if you have a very steady, smooth slope, at the certain point you will be limited by the um, 
light angle collection from the objective uh, um, deriving from numerical aperture. So there are some um, lenses where you need to manually incline the head and really measure. So you can't do that in automation anymore. At least you can manually tilt the head and um, measure. Uh, or in some other equations, you can incline the wall part as well. Uh, that could be as well uh, triggered by uh, conjunctions in, and synchronization between the, the jig and the fixture and the acquisitions, which, for which we have, again, a, a solution path. So those are really the main limitation arise from the fact that you have more informations. That's uh, the eggs and chicken. Okay, thank you, Samuel. Uh, we'll take one more question here. And uh, it is, is this a method that could be used to qualify and or check optics in high volume manufacturing? So high volume manufacturing is usually uh, what I rank as more or less standard optics. Uh, and in that case, um, visual inspections, first of all, can help. And whatever visual inspection is possible, you can use uh, high-speed cameras and um, video system that will spot out uh, scratch dig, which are visible anyway by high. So then you have uh, fast screening 2D methods that that will help you to to go for this high volume. <laughs> 